May I now request Mr. Rajnath Ram um, to come up on the stage and give the keynote speech. Um, Mr. Ram, um, welcome to the summit. Um, I hope you've got a couple of minutes to catch your breath. <laughs> um, Mr. Ram, at Niti Aayog, Mr. Ram leads the initiatives on India climate and energy modeling, GIS mapping, and energy data management. His vast experience in the energy sector includes working on formulation of India's energy vision. He coordinated uh, the finalization of integrated energy policy, which was launched in 2008. He was involved in finalizing the PLI scheme for high efficiency solar PV and module manufacturing. He's been actively involved in preparation of the National Green Hydrogen Energy Mission and has played an important role in the development of RE uh, roadmaps for about eight states. These are, of course, a few uh, highlights of Mr. Ram's contribution. Um, I would like to invite Mr. Ram to the stage for the keynote speech. Just before that, um, in case, folks, uh, if you haven't found a seat to sit on, there is a screen set up in the lower hall in case you'd like to sit. Uh, my apologies, we, are, uh, uh, we don't have enough seats here, but I hope you'll find all these discussions quite useful too. Um, and a quick reminder to have your mobile's phone on silent. Um, thank you. Mr. Ram, over to you. Very good afternoon to all the distinguished participants for this event. And uh, uh, I'm uh, privileged to be part of this discussion. And uh, many, many uh, well wishes to the Vasudha Foundations for bringing such kind of discussions and inviting the, the uh, relevant uh, stakeholders for this discussion. Uh, let me uh, put the perspective of overall uh, government thinking uh, towards the uh, achieving the energy transition and uh, net zero target by 2070. And uh, in the recent past, uh, several initiatives have been undertaken by the government and which have ultimately <laughs> led to uh, an impressive growth as far as the India is concerned, even against the global headwind, India's share in the economic growth is very, very much impressive. Our GDP estimates is even higher at the global average and uh, it's moving around uh, 6.8 to 7.3. Our energy demand appears to be growing around 4 to 5 percent as compared to the global 1.2 percent. But the per capita electricity consumption or the energy consumption, we are far, far below as compared to the world average. Uh, the various announcement by the Honorable Prime Minister, whether it pertains to the, the climate-related activities or apart from the uh, <coughs> other kind of initiatives promoting more Atmanirvarta, uh, uh, the various schemes like uh, PLI, production link incentive relating to the uh, uh, the solar sector and other kinds of sectors uh, has really put India up forefront. And uh, we have become the attractive destination uh, for the investment. <coughs> the, as far as the the uh, climate-related actions and initiatives undertaken and their impact on the SDG. That is also has been seen and reviewed by the global leaders and the countries that we are 
doing fairly well in our the entire strategy and uh, our uh, the major uh, sdgs like uh, sdg 7 sdg 13 as many as 1375 climate activities have been undertaken under sdg 7 and as many as 629 activities relate to the SDG 13. So there are may, many and multifarious activities is undergoing on uh, as far as the climate actions is concerned. On top of that, mission life has also significant role and uh, it clearly connects to the community and the people and uh, uh, provide them a participative role in the energy transition agenda. <coughs> as far as the, uh, uh, the, uh, the energy transition or NDC, updated indices have been announced by the government and achieving the 50% of non-fossil based capacity by 2030, uh, reduction of 45% emission intensity by 2030. We have, uh, from NITI side, uh, started several initiatives. We have uh, built up a, a model we are working in very close coordination with the respective ministries. We are supporting the Prime Minister office also. Uh, and also the state level initiatives. Uh, this time, the, there is a separate budget by the government for a state support mission. And we'll be reaching out all the states to support them, handhold them, capacity building as well for bringing them into the main forum and supporting the uh, achievement of the national goal of what Honorable Prime Minister has envisioned. The uh, RPO analysis is one of the important aspects we have reaching out to the states and we are supporting them in terms of uh, what should be their balance of uh, uh, renewable energy mix to uh, whether they have the in-house capacity or whether they need to uh, go for the uh, uh, the adjacent state so that you can minimize the the transportation or transmission of your uh, electricity uh, uh, and thus how they're reducing your transmission and infrastructure cost so those kind of activities uh, will be involving with the states and will be supporting them. We'll be also handholding in terms of building their dashboard and uh, uh, and also uh, capacity building of their team and institutionalizing some of the tools uh, with them so that these states should also come forward and take a participatory role in achieving the uh, entire uh, goal of a country. <coughs> the uh, in the recent budget, you might have seen that a lot of uh, initiatives have been towards the uh, uh, climate side, on the green growth side, and almost uh, uh, around uh, a lakh crore of uh, budget has been uh, has been announced under this green growth initiatives. As far as the biodiversity is concerned, almost. Seven uh, major diverse, uh, diverse countries and India, uh, the uh, almost 329 million hectares uh, land uh, or the areas have been covered under the uh, biodiversity uh, part. And India has its uh, progressive legislation uh, and the framework to take care of all the aspect of the biodiversity and, and the related uh, issues. And the, the major challenges against, with the, again, uh, 
relating to the re renewable energy sector would be how this renewable should be uh, 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 should be developed so that the all the community participated they also should uh, uh, get benefit uh, out of it so uh, uh, this is in the nutshell uh, uh, from the uh, my side and uh, uh, i think lot of uh, lot of uh, supports from the uh, from the relevant stakeholders uh, when ngos and the the players which are really working together uh, to fulfill the our entire objective of the uh, climate actions and the whatever initiatives have been undertaken or announced by the honorable prime minister and meeting of the climate objective thank you very much Mr. Ram spoke about uh, the RE targets and land use as well. And continuing the focus on land use, I would now like to welcome Joe Kisika to speak about a really interesting tool that they've been uh, developing, which is called Sitrite, and, and, and how it went about. Um, in the previous panel discussions, we spoke about you know what are the solutions to ensuring the RE growth happens in a responsible manner, and this is one of them. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to get a chance to share some of my thinking and thoughts on sustainable energy development. Um, when I was a young professor and researcher about 100 years ago, um, <laughs> I, I think it might be close to 100 years, uh, climate change was something that was going to happen in the future. Well, time has caught up with me, and time has caught up with all of us, um, because climate change is here now. So it's an exciting time to be talking about renewable energy, but there's a huge sense of urgency because um, we can no longer drag our heels. We really have to move and move quickly on solutions to climate change. When we talk about climate change, we're really talking about energy. Lion's share of emissions come from energy. We're not going to address climate change without a radical overhaul of our energy system. We spent over a century building an energy system based on fossil fuels. We have a few decades to shift as rapidly away from that as possible. So again, huge sense of urgency. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of challenges associated with that transition. Right now, the leading uh, energy sources, renewable energy sources, that will make up the largest portion of the new renewable energy are wind and solar. And the reality is they take a lot of space. That land, that space requirement is, can potentially create a lot of conflicts. And that conflict, well, there, there's things that are bad, and I'll talk a little bit about that, it impacts the biodiversity, impacts the local communities, but it's those conflicts and those impacts that can slow the transition. So what we want to do is really recognize those challenges and incorporate them into our planning and our thinking so that we can, we can address them. I'm going to give a little bit of doom and gloom or back, backwards looking doom and gloom. This is actually from a study that was published a couple years ago, um, Ribbon et al. And they looked at uh, wind, solar, and hydropower projects globally from a global data set and, and looked at where those, the footprints of those plants were. And over 2,000 of them were within protected areas or KBAs. KBAs are supposed to be the precursors for new protection. So with the CBD, we're trying to achieve 30%. KBAs are supposed to be teed up to be our new next set of protected areas. Um, and about 900 plus facilities that were being planned also in protected areas or KBAs, so not great. Pick on my home country, this is uh, a picture from Virginia where the leading driver of forest loss in Virginia over about the last decade is solar development. So clearly not on a good trajectory in terms of how development is being put on the ground. It really puts the renewable energy transition right in between the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis. So the amount of energy that we're going to have to build is somewhat mind-boggling. I heard 
some would say 50 gigawatts just for India on an annual basis. Um, that's a lot, and it's going to take a lot of space. And if it's not planned carefully, it's going to push us further on uh, into problems on the biodiversity crisis. We built a tool that we call Global Renewables Watch in partnership with Microsoft and Planet. And actually, that work started right here in India to help feed into the SiteRight tool, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But it's using AI to map wind and solar um, patterns and arrays. And one of the things it lets us do as when we ultimately launch it in a couple months is really track progress at the country level towards their NDC commitments. That's one. And the other is really flag and highlight where country level development patterns are creating land use conflicts, clearing land for things that we don't necessarily want to see impacted. Uh, this is an example from Brazil. And so you, what you can see really quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, is bo for both wind and solar, <coughs> development is happening on forested areas as well as on agricultural areas. Um, I don't have to say much about the forested areas. That's not good. But one of the leading drivers of deforestation in the Amazon is agricultural production. So if we start displacing agricultural production in a, a, a country like Brazil, that is a super, super important for its carbon sink. That agricultural production is going to have to go somewhere. It's likely to go into places like the Amazon. So not great. Similar patterns, actually, um, unfortunately, for India. About 70% of the solar that's been built has been built either on agricultural land or lands that are important for, for natural conservation, nature conservation. Um, wind's a little bit better, and wind integrates nicely into agriculture. We can have a conversation about that. At least the way solar development is happening now, it is a, largely a complete land use replacement. There are ways to integrate solar into ag, but that d tends to be the exception, not the rule. So enough on the doom and gloom. Um, the really positive side of all this is that there is a lot of space that's low environmental impact, often low social cultural impact, yet viable for wind and solar. Um, this is actually from a study that we published. It was a global look that translated NDC commitments into actionable renewable energy targets, and then looked at where and how we could meet those in low conflict places. And what we found is there's about 17 times the area needed um, to meet those NDC commitments. The reality is, though, from past patterns, is it's not happening in that way. So we need a radical shift and change in how we think about, we plan and, and develop renewable energy projects. One is the project by project mentality is way too slow. We're never going to get to 50 gigawatts every year if we still do one project at a time. We don't do an EIA process. Someone mentioned that. But even if you bring an EAI process into the, into the mix, that's not going to be the right way to, to get it done. So we need a, a, a completely different shift on our thinking and on our planning. Um, one of the things that we're really focused on is trying to identify renewable energy go areas. Conservation community is very comfortable telling developers and government where development shouldn't go. But what we're doing is, when we do that, we also do that. I want to make that really clear, and you'll see that through this as I walk through this process. We're also trying to turn, turn the analysis and the planning around and also identify places where development can go. It gets in a very uncomfortable space, but I think it's a key call to action for not only the environmental community, but civil society in general to start convening these kinds of processes to help identify renewable energy go areas. So I'm going to just walk through this really quickly on a generalized framework that underlies our thinking on um, site right as a tool. Yep, we got a. Um, here we go. Okay. So the first, the first piece of this is really thinking about the energy. Um, what does the wind and solar development need? What are those resource thresholds? 
or land use constraints, elevation, slope, those kinds of basic pieces. We set the stage. We also need to think about what's feasible for development. Um, those areas, are they close to load centers? Do they have the transmission capacity? Do they have the roads and access? And we narrow that field a little bit. We also need to take into account things like legal exclusion, so protected areas, areas that are going to be important for expansion of our protected areas as we try to hit our CBD targets. Um, in India, that would include things like tiger corridors. Then there are a bunch of um, environmental values that may not be legally protected, but if ignored, are likely to get pushed back on projects. Uh, someone mentioned the Great Indian Bustard. Uh, that might fall into this category, for example. We have to consider those kinds of things. Otherwise, I think they're going to come back and, and, and create significant problems. The other is social cultural values. So these can be historic, religious sites. Um, they can be how uh, tied to the local landscape individual communities are, dependent on land for their livelihoods. Um, failure to consider environmental and social values, there's mounting data that shows it increases cost overruns of projects, increases costs, and increases the probability that projects don't happen. So if we don't consider them, we're only going to slow the transition. Once we have all that data organized, we can start to look at so we have a suite of places that are low conflict. We can rank them, look at the energy production capacity. We can run different kinds of scenarios. We can say, hey, is there enough space to meet our renewable energy targets on some of these low conflict areas? We can look at business as usual scenarios. Um, there's a variety of things you can do with it. Um, and that's essentially what SiteRight does. Takes that framework and puts it into a publicly available, easy to use tool. Going to get a chance, I think, to demo that in, in just a little bit. A really quick three modules. One is the awareness module. It's really trying to let people understand what's, what are the consequences of business usual development, where might impacts occur, what space is available for low conflict. The site assessment module, which takes a suite of environmental and social values and allows a developer or a government entity to screen a project, you can draw a polygon on the screen, or you can upload a shape file, and it gives you a report back that tells you what might be there so you understand the risks. And then last is the planning module. So if you're a developer and you want for 100 megawatts of solar in a particular district or state, it will use those same site variables in the site assessment model, module, run an optimization that gives you some options that are meet the energy targets, but are also incorporate some of those social and environmental values. So it's a starting point. I will let my colleagues who are going to walk through the SiteRide tool. It's online. Go play with it. <laughs> you can't break it. Um, we definitely, you know, we're interested in feedback. Um, it's available right now for nine states, and that's the, those are the nine states where about 80 plus percent of the renewable energy is projected. So Ultimately, we want to cover the entire country, but we've got a good start with those nine states. You also might check out some of the other sites that we have that discusses some of our, our work on low-conflict renewable energy development. I appreciate the attention and look forward to the conversation. I don't know if there's a chance if anyone has any quick questions or that's up to you. Okay. Freely available, yep, it's, it's, um, you can go to that website and you can ask, have access to all the data and information that's there. Okay, we got one, just one more, yeah. Just wondering, you mentioned there are a lot of those site choices so far have not really followed this framework. I mean, apart from the fact that someone Any uh, restricting factor due to which maybe uh, other sites have been considered which have not been so uh, socially excellent, let's say? That's a, it's a great question. And I, I will admit, I think we're really trying to understand what is ultimately at the heart of 
essentially a failure to recognize some of these environmental and, and social values. I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, a lot of it is just, it's, um, it's the low hanging fruit. It's close to transmission. It um, has good resource potential. And it's, it, it's those factors that are driving the selection of sites. Now, our research shows that you can have that. You can have the environmental and social cultural and still have those energy needs and, and the conditions that are really driving energy development. I mean, ultimately, that's a, it's a key head scratcher as to why development is proceeding in that, in that manner. And I, I will say I don't know exactly why, for sure. Certainly not here in India, but even globally. I, I, this patterns are the same whether you're looking in the US, Europe. So thanks. Thank you, Joe. Um, and my apologies again if you're not able to take a lot of your questions. Joe, I think you're around during lunch. And Joe is very happy to answer your questions. Um, I would now like to uh, invite the speakers for the next panel discussion, um, continuing the theme on land use and, and, and ensuring environmental and social safeguards. Um, if I can invite uh, Mr. Ram, Sushil, Sreshtha, Hari, Brahman, Pooja, and Sanjay. Uh, to the stage, you might see your names here. Um, Sushil, I think you can take the, uh, the name instead of Joseph uh, as well. <laughs> Um, this panel discussion will um, focus on some of the challenges, best practices, and optimal solutions for promoting low impact uh, RE siting and RE development in India, and what it means to safeguard uh, environmental issues and social interests of communities uh, as well. Um, the panel will be moderated by Dr. Sushil Seigal, who is the program director at the Nature Conservancy, and has worked extensively um, on the intersection of conservation and development, including energy. Before we begin the panel, may I please request some of the folks who are standing. There are a few seats that are emptied out here. So if you'd like to move forward, take the seats that you see here. Uh, you, might, uh, you might want to rest your legs a little bit uh, as well. Um, Sushil, over to you. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Um, so, uh, I mean, as he has already mentioned, uh, I, I am not Joe Kissinger. Joe Kissinger is here, uh, but I'm um, uh, Sushil Sagal. Uh, uh, I'm also with TNC, like Joe. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, to have uh, the chance to moderate this panel, which is not only touching on a very, very important issue, as we have uh, you know, discussed right to the morning, but also to have uh, this really esteemed uh, uh, panel members with us. So um, I think uh, I'll just start uh, with just a very few thoughts. We have, I believe, about 45 minutes or so for the panel. Uh, so uh, I'll very briefly uh, start with a few of my own thoughts uh, and then I'll pass on to the panel members to introduce themselves very quickly. Uh, and, and then uh, there are these uh, couple of questions. Uh, that I'll be posing to each of the panel member, like the, what we did in the previous sort of round. So uh, let me just first start again uh, with this broader issue of like uh, achieving our very, very ambitious RE targets while ensuring environmental and social safeguards. I think that's the crux of this panel. And I think uh, it has been touched upon even in the previous panel and Joe's presentation and uh, the presentation by uh, Mr. Rajnath Ram and, and other sort of speakers that went before. Um, it is quite uh, this some data that we keep hearing always is that, of course, on uh, some of the aspects of India, like we have uh, only about, even though we are the seventh largest country in the world, we have around 2.4% of the area of the world, and we are sustaining 18% of the you know population, which I think if the recent media reports are to be believed, we may already be the world's most populous country, having overtaken China recently, or maybe, if not officially, but certainly uh, the media reports suggest that. However, what is less known 
uh, is that in spite of uh, having this kind of uh, sustaining such a huge uh, population on 2.4 percent, we are also one of the mega biodiverse countries in the world. Uh, we are the tenth most forested country in the world. We are one of the few centers, Vavilovian centers of agri biodiversity and origin of domesticated plants in the world. We have set aside a fourth of our, approximately a fourth of our country's geographical area as forest lands, which are kind of a proxy for, uh, you know, various other natural lands also, which are maybe could be grasslands, could be uh, wetlands and so on as well. Um, then uh, we also have uh, this issue of common land was touched upon. So I would, uh, I mean, there are some estimates, Foundation for Ecological Security, of which we have a representative on the panel. They have been working a lot on the commons issue. So we, the country also has a lot of common land. But I want to focus on another sort of area, which is kind of quite mistaken. That's the issue of wastelands, the so-called wastelands. And I started my career with an organization called Society for Promotion of Wastelands Development. So I kind of know a little bit on the subject. We did discuss a lot. And I was fortunate enough to start my career with likes of Dr. Kamla Chaudhary, who not only is credited with his like, first faculty member of IIM Ahmedabad, Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad, and great institution builder. She was also went on to become the first head of National Wasteland Development Board when it was set up way back in 1985. But then, uh, you know, when I looked a little deeper on this subject during my PhD as well. So the, this is a quite a misnomer. Actually, if you look deeply into the historical perspective, and I did go back to the records in, available in the British Library and the India office in UK it's also, they're all, the, the, the driving force was sort of revenue. If the lands were not generating revenue for the government, they, they were kind of wastelands. If you look at some of the kind of descriptions of the wastelands from that era, they were not really degraded lands. They were lands that were simply not uh, maybe uh, under agriculture or amenable to generating revenue for the government at that time. So I think we need to uh, um, bear that in mind. Uh, then on the issue of the social sort of dependence, uh, a few years back, the Forest Survey of India had done an exercise. They just saw that how many are the forest fringe villages in India. It came out to about like more than a quarter of 170,000 villages, they said, are forest fringe villages, which have huge dependence on, 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 on forests and other natural resources. We have uh, I mean, commons I've already sort of uh, spoken about. Also, it is uh, not much appreciated outside India when people talk about indigenous peoples and they, they think of countries like Brazil or some other places, uh, Americas. But we, what we call scheduled tribes, I mean, we, if we, we have the one of the largest sort of population. And a lot of uh, people are still quite connected to the natural resources, quite dependent, as you can see, uh, in terms of fodder, medicinals, fuel wood, and non-timber forest products. We also have the largest livestock population in the world, uh, which, uh, I mean, the huge dependence on the land for, for that as well. Uh, so uh, with this, I will now uh, maybe uh, you know, uh, pass on uh, to my panel members. Uh, very quickly, I'll say we have a very, very eminent panel. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Sanjay Vashisht, who is the founder and CEO of First Green Consulting. Uh, Sanjay, uh, do you want to maybe say a few more words about what you uh, do and a little bit more on your background? Okay, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I represent First Clean Consulting. My name is Sanjay Vashisht and uh, having worked for the last uh, 12 years in renewables, we have been working as a consulting company to the project developers and have been engaged by the project developers in various capacities, right, for the large uh, solar park developments as well as uh, the small rooftop solar projects. Prior to starting First Screen Consulting, I have been in Suzlon. So that's bring my experience in solar as well as wind. I'm happy to be part of this panel to share my thoughts on the development of large scale and how the communities can participate in this. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I think it might be simpler if we uh, uh, just uh, maybe you, you can go next okay. and then we can just pass the mic along. Okay. So. Uh, so good afternoon everyone. My name is Pooja Chandran. I'm representing the Foundation for Ecological Security. Uh, where FES works uh, directly with local communities in over 14 states to strengthen community-led governance of commons. And I am an, I'm an environmental lawyer by training. And uh, I, with FES, I'm working as a legal researcher um, on the issues of polycentric governance and uh, social security and biocultural rights. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Marakrishna Kevi um, from uh, Center for Study of Science Technology and the Policy, uh, based out of uh, Bangalore. Uh, so I basically work on the transmission network uh, planning to integrate more renewables into the network. Uh, we mostly uh, uh, collaborate with the utilities uh, where we get a lot of data and model into transmission network at the state level and at the regional level. And we also provide uh, transmission network strengthening measurements to integrate uh, more renewables into the network. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. I'm Rajnath Ram, Advisor Energy from Niti Aayog. So um, I'm responsible for the program and policy related to the energy sector, including the atomic power. And I'm also uh, uh, leading the initiatives of the uh, energy modeling unit uh, within the Niti Aayog. So we have a very good team and they are working on the net zero energy transition pathways for the country. And we are supporting the states in a big way to how to transform the energy, um, I mean, the states and bring them on board for the energy transition aspect. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, you know, for inviting me in this panel, because I don't specifically work on energy, but what I work is on just energy transition. Uh, so I'm uh, heading the Just Transition program at the International Forum for Environment, Sustainability and Technology. My name is Rishta. Um, the program is, in fact, was born out of our work on energy and climate change. But then looking at the issue of Just Transition, which is a very cross-cutting issue across sectors, uh, industrial sectors, it is moving on to the agricultural sector as well. So we have developed a center in 2021, in fact, which is called the India Just Transition Center, which is basically a platform to bring together various actors, stakeholders from India, national and subnational levels, but as well as from the global south. And this year in G20 presidency, we see how important the global south position is becoming in global negotiations with respect to energy transition, climate action, and also an equitable development. Um, as I forest uh, works on various issues beside this, which in fact supports the program which we have been discussing a little bit today, which is on pollution and waste management, natural resource management, which all somehow also feed, today feed in the bigger you know, goal of climate change action and climate justice. So I'll talk to that and thank you. Hi, I'm Raman Mehta. I work in Vasudha Foundation. I, uh, you know, through my career, I started off in biodiversity conservation and wildlife management issues and then branched out into development, climate, and the interface between the three. So I have exposure on all three sorts of pillars of sustainable development, so to speak. Uh, uh, currently, uh, at Vasudha Foundation, we are looking at climate and energy issues in, uh, you know, uh, in, in a detailed manner. And we're also uh, uh, into developing databases in a big way. And one of the databases that we are working on is the, is the India Climate and Energy Dashboard, which we are doing uh, in collaboration with the Niti Aayog. So that's uh, my introduction. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, all the uh, panel members. Uh, so, uh, as I said, like uh, we, I'll be posing some questions to individual panel members, and I request you to kind of be brief, maybe a couple of minutes to, uh, or so, you can respond, uh, so that we keep some time in the end for uh, some questions from the audience as well. Uh, so, my first question is you, to you, Hari. Uh, 
so now we have heard a lot about this uh, you know this uh, land uh, sort of footprint of renewable energy but solar and wind projects particularly uh, so in your view are there any uh, solutions uh, through which this land footprint could be reduced yeah thank you uh, so uh, uh, yeah apart from uh, ground mounted solar and uh, onshore wind turbines we do have a lot of other uh, options in india like uh, uh, government uh, like neve national institute of wind energy has come up with uh, offshore wind potential of around 127 gigawatt of uh, offshore wind potential for india because india is covered with almost like more than 7600 kilometers of uh, coastal line and mostly uh, these uh, offshore wind potential are uh, near uh, tamil nadu and gujarat tamil nadu is having almost like more than 35 gigawatt and uh, uh, the you know uh, gujarat is having more than 30 uh, 36 or 37 gigawatt of uh, wind potential so we are to tap the offshore wind potential in india and the rest will come across you know the coastal of uh, odisha and also uh, you know coastal of uh, 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 maharashtra uh, so this is one of the, one, one more option we are to tap in india so even though the technology is new to india so we can buy technology from europe and all uh, but the other uh, uh, the challenges associated with this like uh, uh, you know transporting the uh, wind panel is a uh, cumbersome task so i think government has to take some initiatives to develop the manufacturing facilities across the coastal area so uh, i think but otherwise the government has come up with some other uh, incentives like uh, you know transferring or the infrastructure transmission infrastructure from the coastal uh, uh, you know offshore wind turbines to the uh, onshore substation is up to the government's uh, you know uh, risk so it is already mentioned in the uh, wind offshore wind energy policy so other area apart from this offshore wind energy uh, uh, is like like if we can use the abandoned coal mines uh, this will be like we can uh, go with some solar plants so china has already demonstrated uh, one project like they have uh, commissioned almost like 30 uh, you know 300 megawatt of uh, solar plant and the abandoned uh, uh, coal mine like uh, wherever the coal is extracted and the uh, by filling the void of this coal mines you know they can, we can uh, go with uh, a lot of solar potential so as of in 2021 uh, so uh, minister of coal has uh, come up with uh, you know uh, they, they mentioned that like around 29 coal mines are abandoned in uh, india I mean, I mean the coal is already extracted and uh, they have added for uh, filling those coal mines with uh, 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 ash and so if you can even if you can use those 29 uh, coal mines for solar plants i think uh, uh, the area they have mentioned is around like uh, some uh, 981 hectares that means like we can install more than 500 megawatt of solar plants by in that uh, uh, wided uh, coal mines so on the other uh, option uh, that includes like uh, if you can go with uh, the retired thermal plants areas so in 20 in 2018 ca has come up with national initiative plan where it has uh, uh, listed some 22 gigawatt of solar plants for retirements in the you know from 2017 to 2022 uh, so among these almost like some more than 10 gigawatt of uh, thermal plants have been retired in this uh, time frame so even if you can use this land for for us for solar power development uh, you know almost like uh, for each megawatt of thermal plant uh, you know the land requirement is of the order of like 0.6 acres to 1 acres so among these 10,000 acres if we can utilize properly you know we can still install 2,000 megawatt of uh, solar plant uh, in this uh, retired, retired you know the advantage with this retired, therm retired thermal plants area and also uh, with the coal mains is that we don't need to go for new transmission infrastructure because transmission infrastructure is already there so if you can use this wisely you know we can uh, come up with a lot of solar plants and uh, you know offshore wind and also the uh, onshore uh, wind plants respectively yeah. yeah thank you thank you so much Hari. uh so yeah so there are i mean a lot of options that are available which are coming up for reducing the land footprint so you did uh, apart from like offshore you mentioned and a few others i think i'm sure like some of the audience members will have questions maybe on that but like uh, uh, for the details uh, but you also mentioned abandoned, I think, uh, coal mines and lignite mines. I, be, I know iForest has been working uh, on uh, like those sort of issues. So, Shreshta, uh, can you just build on that further and uh, 
can you just explain what sort of potential do we have uh, for repurposing coal and lignite mines uh, for uh, re renewable energy development? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, at IFORES, one of the things we have been really looking into how some of the states, which will be most hard hit by the transition, can also diversify the economy, substitute revenue, and create jobs. Because that is going to be the biggest question. And without it, a transition cannot happen. And that has led us to the question of looking into what are the potential ways to diversify the economy. And one of the biggest ways is to, of course, boost uh, renewable energy. Now, uh, now, when you think of renewable energy, the challenge is also, you know, the transition that is happening and going to happen largely is in the states of eastern India, such as Chhattisgarh, Orissa, Jharkhand. The challenge is also that these states have a large amount of area under tribal land. These are, they have, like Chhattisgarh, almost every coal district is a Shiru pipe district. So there is a challenge in acquisition of land or, uh, you know, diversion. Therefore, what we looked into is what is the potential of repurposing the land that is available with coal mines, eventually when slowly mines start closing, be it because of, uh, you know, exhaustion of resources, uneconomic production, or some accelerated closure within the next three to four decades due to the climate action. Now, when we look at this, overall I need to give some understanding that there is about 0.34 million hectares of land that is available with coal mines in India. And out of this, about 67% of land is available with open cast mines. Now why I'm saying open cast mines? Because how you can use the land depends on the ownership of the land. Now, if it's underground mines, a lot of times the surface right is already with the government and there are some activities already going on there. For example, there are schools, there are, you know, other infrastructure, uh, many, many things. But the key opportunity therefore lies with repurposing of the land that is available with open cast mines. Now, these are the land that is available with largely mines that are currently operational, going to close down, say, because of age in the next 10 to 15 years and all. But then there is also a large amount of land that is available with abandoned or discontinued mines. And as per the estimates of the Government of India of February 2022, there are 293 such mines in India, combining open cast and underground. And out of these, 284 are with Coal India Limited. So here is the opportunity. And if we look into the statistics, out of these, 75% of abandoned mines are in the concentrated in the states, largely in Jharkhand, West Bengal, and Chhattisgarh. Now, if I do an overlap of the amount of land that is available with coal mining in eastern region states, which is about 0.2 million hectare out of 0.4 million hectare, and I look into the abundant mine land potential that is available with it, it's a huge amount of land. But not all of that land can be used for RE development because it depends on, you know, there are voids, there are overburdened dams, there are insects, so not all that. But even if we take part of it, because there is a lot of land that is available with identified as a built up area as well as stabilized overburden. These are the two, if I, as iForest, we analyzed about now 50 mine, mine closure plants. And if we analyze that, the significant potential lies with stabilized overburden areas as well as the built-up areas that are available after post-closure. And this is the land that is most opportunistic for developing, particularly solar. I'm not getting into anything else, but at least it's huge potential for solar energy. The other reason we think it is an important is because also, you know, we have been talking about how energy access can be improved in these areas, how they can, you know, fulfill their RPO requirements. And one of the key opportunities is that not a lot of RE investment today are going to these states which are going to face transition challenges. So therefore, this provides an opportunity, in fact, for these states to develop their in-house RE potential 
which will also lead to economic diversification, job creation, as well as revenue substitution. And Suja, as you have been talking about, you know, alienation of land, land acquisition, the challenges of getting clearances, all that good sort, a lot of this can be actually precluded if this land is. So this is what we have been trying to do at iForest. The good news is also that there is quite amount of Government of India support now to do this. In fact, in April 2022 this year, the Union Cabinet has uh, come up with a policy guideline observing that there is a lot of amount of land that is available with abandoned mines, with the coal industry, that has been acquired by under the Coal Bearing Areas Act, can be used for energy infrastructure development. Now, this energy infrastructure development not necessarily means everything is RE. There are many, many things that are under it. But one of the things that is there is RE. Because I'll stop to this because there are challenges also with transfer of land just to any industry or government to develop energy infrastructure. Because the land that is acquired and most of the coal mining land has been acquired under the Coal Bearing Areas Act is today with Coal India Limited. So the government has come up with a mechanism, at least for the time being, that some of this land can be used for energy infrastructure development, including RE. So between the policy side and between, if we look into the statistics, and I hope there will be more policy reforms and policy initiatives taken up, a huge amount of land can be opened up potentially in all of these states for RE development and to address some of the key questions of energy transition that we all are grappling with, how to create jobs, how to substitute revenue, and how to bring in you know, industrial investments in these areas. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Shrishta. Um, now, uh, moving on to this, uh, to Raman, I mean, you said that also, that uh, of course, you are quite uh, nicely placed because you worked on biodiversity issues for many years before. Uh, uh, now you are working a lot on the renewable energy issues. So, uh, now the question to you is that, uh, what do you see like this uh, if the RE projects are not planned in a responsible manner, what could be the potential impact on biodiversity? So, uh, you know, in terms of the, the actual impacts on biodiversity, basically uh, in an RE context, they arise out of careless siting, to put it you know, bluntly. And like Joe, Joe said, already alluded to the fact that it's not just in India, but globally, the norm by the RE industry has been careless siting. And that's kind of led to these sorts of impacts. So uh, there are also then these associated kind of impacts uh, or secondary impacts where if you are not careful about uh, you know, when you when you uh, set up a project, then you're not careful about how uh, you, you are going to evacuate the power that you generate. And that evacuation process uh, leads to further biodiversity loss like it happened in the Great Indian Bustard uh, sort of case. Uh, so, uh, and, and you know, this has been discussed. A lot of panelists, even in the first panel, have already alluded to this, that uh, we need to get into a sort of a protocol, uh, uh, an industry protocol, which, which looks at siting very, very carefully after integrating and, you know, uh, taking on board uh, uh, biodiversity concerns. Now, the, so, so one is that I would like to just briefly uh, touch upon why is it that we want to preserve biodiversity. One is that there is a direct sort of economic benefit uh, to many, many people. Uh, so in India alone, they say that about 200 million people depend directly on biodiversity resources for their food, you know, and their, their medicines and so on and so forth, and their livelihoods. So that's, you know, that's a huge uh, uh, number, uh, uh, you know, of people. And the other part is that you know, we don't, we don't always make this association, but a large amount of, uh, of economic prosperity or economic development is also underpinned uh, by, you know, natural resources, environment, biodiversity. Uh, and if you, if, if, if you lose biodiversity, if you lose your natural resources, 
your your uh, you know underlying progress uh, tends to get uh, you know arrested in the long run i mean there's this celebrated case of uh, what's happening in joshi mart i mean you keep keep ignoring environmental uh, issues and environmental impacts and stuff happens so you know i don't want to derail the discussion and you know talk about it too much but that's the sort of uh, risks we are looking at so i would actually a lot has been said about you know how to integrate aia processes about how to you know be be careful in terms of citing and so on i and and you know people have alluded to the fact that there is a cultural problem in terms of you know integrating biodiversity concerns into project uh, project planning project you know execution project development and project operations but i uh, uh, would like to sort of you know use this forum to appeal especially to industry uh, because they are the ones that kind of drive behavior in a sense within the ecosystem to uh, be a little more sensitive and a little more knowledgeable than they are at the moment or that's what to us outside the ecosystem of uh, re developers seems to be the case that they're not they're not sensitive enough and they don't you know uh, acquire enough knowledge about these sorts of concerns and integrate them into their project planning process which is what needs to happen in the first place and the reason uh, why this is important is also because wherever even so we are now saying let's have a eia kind of process in in renewable energy uh, uh, projects also but you know uh, having looked at how the eia process itself uh, used to work or has been working or continues to work i'm not sure we are achieving anything by doing those sorts of eias and i, I mean i don't again don't want to derail the discussion on what happens uh, in the eia process and how that process uh, is followed but that also is primarily driven by this whole pressure uh, again primarily by the industry to uh, and this is not i'm not specifically alluding to the re industry but you know industries across the board where they tend to kind of look at look at that whole process as a compliance issue in terms of okay we need to you know check this box and get going and so that is something that needs to change how that will change you know what will drive that change uh, is something that one needs to think about but in a nutshell that's what the other point i wanted to make about land just a quick point uh, and you know people alluded to india's target 500 gigawatts and so on and so forth i'm saying even and this is a quick back of the envelope calculation uh even if we were to do say a 1000 gigawatts a 1000 gigawatts the amount of land that we require say for solar and if i was to just go overboard and say another 1000 gigawatts of wind i think the the amount of land that we actually need if you were to multiply you know what what land is required to set up uh, the, this capacity that land area is less than 1% i i i doubt if it is you know even exceeds 1% of india's land mass we can find 1% you know if we were uh, careful enough and if we were you know willing to sort of be careful so that's uh, and, and so therefore we should also not and that's the other message i want to give we should not be worried about the global the recently signed global biodiversity framework to which india is also signatory where we are saying 30% of land and 30% of water to be brought under uh, conservation oblique protection and that's a target uh, that is to be achieved by 2030 that's where i'd like to yeah. stop that thanks thanks uh, raman so i mean moving on uh, i mean the similar question to you pooja your organization has been working a lot with local communities across india i know i've been associated in some way with your organization in the past not Uh, as an employee but then be somebody as a partner and we have uh, so i've observed uh, that uh, you have been working very closely for many many years and decades so uh, the same question that i posed to raman but now uh, from the local community's perspective 
So what, what risks do you see uh, of this expansion? Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, like, so you said that, so we don't directly work on energy, but we work directly with local communities and how they are responding to the changes and uh, the, the effects of land use changes in general. Uh, but if I zoom out a little bit, the question um, also comes down to the fact that who are these local communities that we're talking about? Uh, because the priority of each and every community is different. It may not always be homogeneous in nature. So that's keeping that one fact in mind. Uh, I think the second question when we also look at like where is this land even coming from? And as has been established since the morning that we're looking at arid and semi-arid regions. Uh, the wasteland narrative again we've also touched upon today that Largely, it's, it's also a tip to our colonial legacies that we're still carrying on and the narrative as well, which, is, uh, con which continues to dominate our perceptions as well. And to also somewhere partly answer the question that was raised earlier, that is primarily why we also are looking at these lands, because we think it doesn't have productive value or it's uncultivable or, or you know, it should be uh, diverted to more productive uses. Uh, but there's a huge subset that we're ignoring in that process. Um, I think farming communities we already know of because, uh, and, and for that too, I think 85% of uh, or the farmers in the, in the country are small and marginal farmers. So they own less than two hectares of land um, in general, which in itself is such a stark fact. But there are also other communities which completely go under the radar. Uh, the pastoral communities are one. If we're talking about off, uh, like coastal projects, we're talking about fishing communities, we're talking about salt pan workers, we're talking about uh, forest dwelling populations, not just indigenous uh, tribes, in, but for people who depend on forests in general, denotified tribes. So there are a lot of different kinds of communities that we don't yet understand uh, and we are yet to even engage with in the first, first go itself and uh, who definitely need to be a part of this conversation too. So um, they also, if, if you look at the laws that we also have, so the LAR Act was referred to in the morning, but if you look at the per perception of that act itself, it's also talking to the landowners. We're still talking to pe the farmers and we're not talking to the farm laborers, people who are dependent on the land, uh, but may or may not have a title. So there are, uh, of course, livelihood impacts, which we have been talking about since the morning. But when we're talking about commons as well, which again is dominated in, uh, which if you look at all the states which have the maximum uh, capacity, uh, there are there is a huge population which depends on commons in these areas. So over here, we're um, also we're not yet engaging with these communities in the first step. So this is the first thing that we also need to take into account. But when we talk about commons, is also the cultural uh, and the social cultural values that are associated with land. Uh, their lives are deeply entrenched and they are deeply intertwined with the land and the landed resources uh, that they depend on. So we're also talking about a loss of cultural identity, uh, alienation and displacement is something which is just going to compound that. So these are some of the things that can directly impact them, but the indirect impacts could be, say, the uh, consumption or overconsumption of water if a, a park is, has been installed in the nearby area. So. Um, and again, because these are dry land areas, that's going to have a much, much bigger uh, role to play when we're looking at all of these facts. So um, these are some, some of the things that I, I also thought at flat. So one thing we've talked about already is bringing um, em environmental impact assessments. But I think I would also echo what uh, Raman said, that we need, what we need is a better public discourse. What we need is a, more, a bigger policy commitment to these issues. And, and a mandatory EIA or an SIA is just going to be one step in the process, but definitely we need a higher consciousness to discuss, to start talking about these issues. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pooja. Uh, so uh, just moving on in the same spirit, uh, uh, right now Sanjay, uh, to actually comment, comment on what, what, in your opinion, is the current uh, state of play with respect to community participation and their uh, sort of pre-informed uh, pre uh, and prior uh, pre and informed consent regarding these pr uh, projects as the as RE projects are rolled out. So can you uh, yeah, comment on yeah. that? Thank you. <clears throat> see, we have to see uh, that this journey of renewable development started uh, way back in 2010, especially solar wind started another 10 years back. 
So it's a 20 years journey. Initially it was wind, but then the solar came up in a big way. And now we are close to about 100 gigawatt of installation and about 500 gigawatt are the targets which we are talking right now. So wind was not a problem in terms of the community participation and all that. But when it came to solar, we started barricading the land and people had the restriction of movements. And we have seen few photographs circulating WhatsApp groups that farmers are breaking the solar panels and they are angry farmers. And they so uh, over the period, we have realized that uh, people are uh, not uh, having belongingness to those things. The original idea was like uh, we are a uh, country with a lot of farming, uh, you know, related activities, and if solar is also becoming a third crop to the farmer, then it will uh, it will help in my uh, in reducing the migration from the rural areas to the urban centers. Certainly, this has a potential to address that problem, but what happened? In 2010, we started with one megawatt type of projects. In 2005, we became a typical five megawatt types uh, projects and bids were like that. A couple of years later, we became like 50 megawatt, and now we are like 500 megawatt tenders are there. And uh, the business, uh, which was like, uh, forget about community, even the business houses, like it was participation by five, 500 people. Now it is hardly a bunch of, a dozen of people only command the whole sector. So uh, that has led to uh, certainly a price discovery, which we are seeing. We are very feeling very happy that we have reached to a price level of some two and a half rupees or close to two rupees sometimes. But what we have gained out of it, the idea is that um, we wanted to involve the communities in this whole process. So the second thought came that Prime Minister Kusum scheme was also launched. And uh, not only the pump houses, but the idea was that let them install solar in their farms, whatever land they have, the downside of land they can cultivate, and the surplus power they can sell. On paper, it looks a very good idea. And a target of some 10,000 megawatt was given for this part. It was good that people started feeling happy, now I can install solar, and they gone back uh, we, because we come from consulting community, we were laughing that this scheme will not take off. Uh, the current statistics is like out of 10,000 megawatt of target, hardly 50 megawatt has been realized, commissioned. So that's the outcome reason. No subsidy in that component of Kusum scheme, which involves the up to 2 megawatt installation. The farmer want to go to take loan. He is asked for the collaterals, therefore he will bring the collaterals. The interest rates are 12% plus. And finally, the tariff, the, the, the so-called feed-in tariff, which we talk, it is 3 rupees 15 pesa. Okay. No, no, no working paper has been shared that this is how we bring the tariff of 3 rupees 15 pesa. Every time when we we started uh, solar in 2010, we were having a discussion paper that this is how the tariff, feed-in tariff. We are not talking of reverse bid, we are talking of feed-in tariff at farm, farmer level. We have to be honest about this community. While uh, the farmer is crying that he is not getting adequate price for his commodities to be sold, the same thing is happening that if, even if he has a produced commodity, that is the solar power. He is not being adequately compensated to that. What if we pay one rupees more to these farmers and buy that electricity? It doesn't matter. For government, it will address a huge problem of you know migration to the urban areas. We are giving so many things as subsidies. Forget about the subsidy. Just increase the price viability so that this 10,000 megawatt target should become to 20,000 megawatt. We have realized, of course, the scheme was over and the government is coming up with yet another one-year extension. I am sure 
those things will be uh, addressed as part of community participation. We have seen solar farms in Europe where uh, the, 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 the grass grazing is allowed by the sheep and buffaloes. It is not being allowed. So a lot of problems. Yeah. So I, I'm sure we will address. This. So yeah, I'm. Uh, okay, is that a hard stop or can we get another five minutes or so? Because they're, they're telling us that we have only five minutes. Anyway, uh, so what uh, we'll, we'll try to wrap up because I wanted to give some chance to audience members if possible. But anyway, I think uh, uh, quickly uh, now to Raj, uh, the, uh, your kind of views on like what is the thinking or what would be your advice because you are the primary sort of uh, you know think tank for, on behalf of the government on these issues or whether have you already given some advice or are you like formulating or what could be your advice? Bruno, I was hearing to all the uh, uh, panelists here, uh, the biggest problem uh, uh, for the country is the land acquisition. I mean, it's not very easy task and uh, 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 so a lot of problem there. Uh, but uh, coming back to the RE uh, part, uh, the, uh, the estimate for the 750 gigawatt of uh, solar has been on the best of the uh, west, 3% uh, of wasteland. And uh, the wasteland is largely on the control of the government. I think government has to really uh, come forward and they have to identify the right kind of land for the uh, for the uh, installation of uh, renewable energy sources. That's one part. The second aspect, again, I mean, some of the biodiversity area, that needs to be also taken care. Uh, already we have the uh, legislative provisions, but uh, the, uh, the government, the state government has to clearly, uh, I mean, take care, including the even the central government, uh, to take the utmost uh, care of uh, the biodiversity part. So that's important. Like the GIB the case, uh, which unnecessarily, I mean, around 8 gigawatt of uh, uh, <coughs> solar uh, uh, installations lying idle and we are not able to move ahead. Uh, if due care had been taken by the uh, respective agency, probably this problem would have not risen. So that is also, but again, I mean, the government is taking steps and they are uh, uh, pursuing with the, I mean, uh, all kind of source of uh, approaching the uh, Honorable Supreme Court for resolving the issues. So that's another part. But, but there are a lot of opportunities still available where we can significantly reduce our uh, land requirement for the for the resources. One, of course, uh, um, one panelist, Mr. Hari, has mentioned about the offshore, offshore wind, and a lot of potential exists within the country, and uh, government is coming forward, and the two sites on the east of the Tamil Nadu and the, and the west of Gujarat has been identified, and uh, almost 70 gigawatt kind of potential. But the government has to come forward with this uh, solar, uh, this uh, wind power is, offshore wind power is costly. Government has to come forward and they have to really take uh, charge of the building the infrastructure. Because, and they have to provide a really base for building the uh, offshore wind platform. So that's uh, one aspect. Certainly the another big giant is the solar rooftop. I and mean, that has really not taken forward. If that is taken uh, in a very serious mode, uh, and I think a lot of uh, your land uh, acquisition part would be taken care of. But again, the problem lies with the states, DISCOM, DISCOM being the main uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, player here, and they find that this is, uh, RE is uh, their biggest enemy. Uh, so they delayed the process for uh, coming out of the net meeting, and the, I mean, so many issues and uh, so that's one big area I mean certainly uh, if a solar rooftop is taken in a big way it can really generate a lot of a uh, solution. Again uh, the MNRA has come out with the uh, estimation of uh, your wind power if you increase your mast height so your 
uh, repowering can be done. So that could be another potential area uh, where we can look for the uh, reduction of uh, land use. Uh, uh, but uh, we, at the same time, we have to also look for the other kind of resources like uh, hydro. Hydro is a uh, is a big potential for the country and almost 150 gigawatt and we are hardly harnessed around 47, 48 gigawatt. But it's still 100 gigawatt, there is potential. So we are working uh, very closely with Ministry of Power and the respective states. So how this can be expedited and taken in a mission mode. The other aspect has been mentioned about the repurposing of uh, land the coal mine area and etc. There are also I see a big big problem. Reason being by the already some economic activities are there and people are uh, greatly attached with the mines area. They have their uh, livelihood uh, unless they find a clear visibility where uh, about their livelihood. They are not going to shift uh, or leave this that position. So that the one major. Uh, uh, Problem we still we are facing in the Jaria coal mine, where uh, the fire um, is, it has taken a long time. But still, we are not able to displace the people. Even the government has taken a huge push and they're building the uh, entire infrastructure, they're building housing, everything. But people are still if so emotionally attached, they are not able to move. So, how to tackle this issue? This is the big, big area. I think, really, uh, in the just energy transition, we have been talking so much. And Sista has talked about this. So that's another area yes. we really have to uh, see in a big way. But uh, uh, anyway, I mean, this is a part and parcel of the problem. But uh, uh, the role that we are trying to envisage from the government side to how to bring the state on, on board for in, uh, towards uh, achieving the entire uh, of, uh, vision for the country. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ranaji. We are, I think, out of time. Uh, so, but I would like, like, maybe each panelist, if just 10 seconds each, if you have to give one idea only, like, based on, like, for the RE sector to incorporate environmental or social concerns so that uh, we achieve, you know, our targets and goals, just one idea. If you have, want to say just one thing, what it will be. I think we can start with Raman and just end. But just 10 seconds each, we are actually uh, really out of time. Okay, I'll try to do it in 10 seconds. I think uh, be more sensitive to and uh, seek more knowledge on biodiversity and environmental issues before you plan your projects. Thank you. Prishta, you can just pass the mic. Here. So very briefly, you know, because we are working towards a... Um, we are talking of green growth, and I would really hope that we have the necessary mechanisms in place to support this green growth where it is most necessary, uh, instead of where the momentum is already there that is growing. But we would definitely like, and that's why I gave the examples of certain states. And as Rajnati shared, the, one of the biggest challenges will be for the bringing the states on board, because the states and the center has to work together on this, because land is a very critical issue. And it is in the concurrent risk of our constitution. So we need to be careful about that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think uh, bringing awareness to the people and also showing them a path that how the green initiative can uh, uh, help uh, improving their life. Thank you. Yes. So uh, 10 seconds is like uh, we need to work on the untapped potential like uh, offshore wind energy and other areas like canal top, floating PV, Railways, roadways, so if you can uh, tap some of these options, I think we can still achieve find gigawatt in an easy manner. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we should think of agri-solar, uh, use uh, land below the solar panels as well as rooftop segment. These are the two areas. Land problem will be solved. Thank you. Uh, so the first one is going to be contextualized solutions. We've talked about a lot of different solutions, but they might be anecdotal. We need to think about... Uh, the implications before scaling them. Second is to bring those who are going to lose the most on the same table as those who are going to gain the most or rather change the table itself. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to, yeah, we are, I, I know we are completely out of time. Just a few more seconds. Uh, uh, when I would like to really thank all the panelists and I think the panel brought out this 
aspect clearly that unless we address, uh, proactively address environmental and social issues, it, they, it will be challenging to meet our ambitious RE targets. It is in the interest of meeting and promoting you know, the RE uh, in the country uh, that we do need to look at these issues uh, a bit seriously. And my last one point I would say uh, is like, uh, I've been mean wastelands. Just the, the term itself is very loaded. Just think about the historical origin of this term. It was not always degraded land. So keep, I think, that in mind when some particularly terms like Garman, Kin Pahad, Sivayachak and all that, they just meant something else uh, earlier. And now that the, the term wastelands gives a different connotation to it. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks. I, we have unfortunately run out of time for any audience questions, but please do, uh, you know, uh, uh, talk to the panelists during the lunch break or other breaks. Thank you so much.